And you know, we just don't work as like a, as a lender. We actually sometimes take like a, a JV role in the transaction, and we like to have a sort of value add approach, not just bringing the financing to the table, but bringing together you know a team of the right people to move a transaction forward, or just taking a fresh look at it and say, you know, um, based on experience, the, the reason why you haven't gotten funding because of these handicaps and hurdles. If we can overcome these or take a different route, we could probably get you to the funding that you need. Welcome to CREPN Radio for influential commercial real estate professionals who work with investors, buyers, and sellers of commercial real estate coast to coast. Whether you're an investor, broker, lender, property manager, attorney, or accountant, we're here to learn from the experts. Welcome to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network CREPN Radio. This is episode number 69. Weekly, we share interviews with real estate experts passing on their experience and knowledge. Thanks for joining us this week. My name is Jay Darren Gross. We're so glad you're here. We are always looking for information that can help you move your real estate investing to the next level. In just a minute, we're going to speak with Adam Cohen. Adam is a returning guest. He was featured on episode number 43, where we got to know him and about uh, his start in real estate investing. Today, we talk with him about real estate financing, and specifically a real estate financing business that he has developed to help investors who need funds to get deals done. If you have a real estate investment opportunity and you've been turned down by a bank, where do you go? Adam is an experienced investor and has learned to think outside of the box. This thinking is precisely what creative financing is all about, and Adam shares how creative financing can help investors in need of funding. If this is your first time tuning in, we want to make sure and welcome you. Thanks for tuning in. If you're a returning guest, or excuse me, a returning listener, uh, we want to thank you for Uh, tuning in and coming back. And uh, if you've not yet subscribed to our program, please consider doing so. It's really easy. You can do it uh, one of a couple ways. Uh, You can either go to our website, commercialrealestatepronetwork.com, and if you click on the podcast link on the menu bar on the homepage, uh, it'll take you to our podcast page. And on that, there is a button that says subscribe, and you can choose from Stitcher or iTunes, whichever you are. Uh, or whichever you prefer. Or you can simply go to the iTunes or Stitcher website and with your account log in, and in the search bar, type in Commercial Real Estate Pro Network. And uh, when our logo pops up, it's the earphones with C-R-E-P-N between the ears. Go ahead and click subscribe, and you're done. And uh, now you'll be able to listen wherever you choose. Uh, and uh, if you uh, like... Uh, if you like the program, we'd love to love to see your likes. That always helps us as well. Uh, I want to invite you if you're if you'd like to uh, reach out and connect. Uh, there's a couple different ways you can do that. Or if you have a deal you'd like to discuss, or you'd like some input from me on on uh, insurance matters you might have, go ahead and reach out to me. You can do or the easiest way probably is just go to the website commercialrealestatepronetwork.com, and in the contact uh, button, hit that and uh, send me an email. Uh, or give me a call and, and uh, we will uh, we'll connect and uh, work through whatever you got going on. If I can help you, I will do everything I can to do that. And uh, before we uh, get on with the show, I just want to also invite you, if you are on LinkedIn, please check out our group, Commercial Real Estate Pro Network. It's a great place to uh, network with real estate, uh, commercial real estate professionals, and we hope you'll consider joining the group. All right, let's get on with the show. On the line today, I'm fortunate to have a returning guest, Adam Cohen. Adam is a, an investor, an international investor, and if you'd like to hear uh, his uh, prior episode, he's on episode number 43, where we got into uh, how he got started and uh, all, of, all of that fun stuff. But uh, he's also the founder of uh, uh, West One International, and I'm excited to have him back. Adam, welcome back to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me again. Well, I'm I'm excited to talk to you. We've uh, it's been a little while since we we last talked, and uh, I know you're a, you're a man that uh, makes things happen, and and your plate's usually full. And I'm I'm excited to get into what you're up to now. But before we do that, uh, if you could remind the listeners uh, or fill in the, the gaps here a little bit about uh, your background and uh, how you how you got into where you are now. 
Okay, well, I'm originally from London, London, England. Um, came out to the U.S. in 99. Um, my background in real estate and finance evolved from, you know, starting my first real estate company in London, which, you know, ultimately led into me getting into real estate finance as well, more by accident than intentionally. Um, but that said, uh, it was an area that I kind of was very drawn to. And over the years, and especially since I've been in the U.S., uh, I've, you know, been involved in multiple entities, most specifically since 2010, West One International, which was a company I started post-recession, kind of tackling uh, many of the issues that I had experienced myself and you know many of my clients, you know, during the recession, uh, building up the you know creative financing and focusing on that world. Well, and and creative financing is is uh, definitely kind of the cornerstone to getting real estate investment real estate deals done and uh, let's talk a little bit about that if um, if you would uh, tell us a little bit about West One International and and what you're doing with West One International okay well, well West One International is a company I started um, five years ago five, well, actually nearly six and a half years ago time flies huh? um, and you know the concept of the company is, a, is a, you know we're a direct lender you know and we specialize in creative financing solutions for distress assets usually distress assets or um, commercial real estate and also kind of luxury residential properties uh, we've done like bailout loans reorganization loans foreclosure bankruptcy um, you name it poor credit and you know we've also come up with um, creative solutions to getting new construction projects underway where they've had minimal resources but a good project and that's kind of the area where we focus you mentioned uh well just kind of the the state of the market there i mean construction or or, or whether it be a project that's got some hair on it um what, what's the typical customer look like that, that's coming to you is there a is there, are they coming to you after they've tried elsewhere and got nothing accomplished are they coming directly to you Tell us a little bit about how what a normal deal looks like. You know, well, our, our regular customers generally come to us first. So, you know, but, you know, my regular customers probably amount for about less than ten percent of my average workflow. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, most of the clients that come to us have usually been to the banks and been turned away. They've been to the equity funds, and they were either too large or too small, or too, or you know, the market was too diverse, or it wasn't a major market. Um, you know, so those are kind of a lot of what we get. Uh, there are a lot of brokers out there that get deals that, you know, just shop everything around. That they, they don't really know what they're doing. And then what happens is by chance or through referral, we end up getting the file. And, you know, we just don't work as like a, as a lender. We actually sometimes take like a, a JV role in the transaction and we like to have a sort of value-add approach, not just bringing the finance to the table, but bringing together, you know, a team of the right people to move a transaction forward or just taking a fresh look at it and say, you know, um, based on experience, the, the reason why you haven't gotten funding because of these handicaps and hurdles. If we can overcome these or take a different route, we could probably get you to the funding that you need. And that's kind of where we step in. But, yeah. Well, and, and just to kind of uh, go back and make sure that this point's made or understood is that uh, – you know, typically I, I would have thought of what you're doing is kind of the, the hard money uh, loan. Is that is that fair to say? Not in every case. I mean, on a construction deal, hard money isn't always the best policy. It's okay for, say, a 5 to $10 million transaction, but when you start adding a zero to that equation, uh, then hard money is, is not always the best policy. Well, it's you know, too rich for hard money. In that case, we work with international banks and funds that we have relationships with to kind of take a more kind of seasoned approach. So what's the average length of a, of a loan that you would, you would uh, fund? Uh, on the hard money side, it's generally 12 to 18 months, but, you know, we will go up to two years and you know, on a good property, even three. Uh, on the construction side, most of our construction kind of scenarios are, you know, a three- to five-year plan. Got it. And on your uh, side, I was looking at you, you guys, uh, bridge loans, that, that most often like the, uh, the luxury home, or is that uh, commercial as well? 
We do, with the bridge lending we do for uh, commercial property, like such as office, mixed use, retail, um, warehouse, light industrial. Uh, we like um, luxury properties. We're starting to steer away from the smaller properties. We used to do a lot of like the two to five hundred thousand kind of fix and flip houses. We've uh, really kind of moved away from that market now, having our minimum threshold of five hundred thousand. Um, but generally, we prefer our loans to be uh, a million plus. But you know, the five hundred thousand to a million dollar range has been quite a, a popular market for us that we've had uh, minimal issues with so we continue to run that product and when somebody uh, approaches you and they present their their uh, loan paperwork and kind of get a chance to work through uh, what it is they're trying to do what, what, what kind of a time frame are you guys able to um, you know turn around and, and approve or fund the, the loan We've closed hard money loans in as quickly as four or five days, and generally we say two to three weeks. You know, sometimes you know they take longer due to uh, title issues or you know like bankruptcy issues or you know, getting a payoff from another lender. But um, generally speaking, our hard money loans should be a you know a, a, say a seven to ten day process. It's in that range. It's not a very long time if everything's in place. You know, delays do happen. You know, it's usually non related to us. So the current market sounds like it's providing plenty of opportunities for you guys to uh, uh, make uh, make loans for, for clients. Do you have any kind of sense of of what's what's about to happen? I know that I just looked on the paper today. The feds are – sounds like they're almost uh, 100% committed to raising interest rates. Do you think that's going to uh, uh, create more opportunities for, you know, companies like, like West One? Yeah, you know, in general, it should. Uh, I mean, for example, you know, when the banks start raising interest rates, then you know our fees, which are higher than the average you know, the bank, obviously, uh, become less uh, onerous and more acceptable to the market. Again, you know, we have the ability to do no prepayment penalties. You know, we can close very quickly. Bank loans, you know, take longer to close. And conventional lending, you know, we're not a conventional lender. You know, we don't represent to be also. Um, that really applies more, I think, to the homeowner's market. So, like, you know, someone is going to buy their, you know, first home or they're looking to sell their house and buy a new house, that's really a market that I'm not so involved with. Uh, you know, so that shouldn't affect us too much. On the commercial side, a lot of the people that come to hard money, you know, they're doing it because they need a creative solution to get into the property, knowing that they will refinance a year or two down the road. So it shouldn't affect my. It shouldn't negatively affect our business. Uh, I don't see it having a huge influence on us. But overall, you know, when there's a, raise, a rise in interest rates, the market does tend to soften and prices maybe fall a little bit because people are compensating, you know, cost versus servicing versus cash flow, and those factors all play into you know a decision making process when people are buying real estate. Right. Um, I'm just trying to think here. So the the marketplace, you guys are. I mean, it seems like you're you're able to go from almost A to Z. Is that I mean is that pretty fair? As far as uh, is there any kind of a type of property that you will not lend on? I mean, other than we, you well, the smaller <laughs> residential stuff, or you know, yeah. Yeah, we've walked away from. Uh, we've never been the you know the uh, owner occupied market. That's never been our market, and you know we have moved away from where well, we used to look at properties from say two hundred and fifty to five hundred thousand. We have pretty much dropped that entire program. Although we had some pretty good successes with it, we just found it was a mostly less less educated investor. You have issues with appraisals, you know, um, more difficulty in refinancing, and generally kind of a less sophisticated and savvy investor. And uh, we just find that we'd rather work with more qualified and more experienced and uh, better quality assets. Got it. Let me, I'm just trying to uh, look through here on, on your – so you guys do multifamily, you do the bridge, and you do the commercial. Um, is there a, a, a part of the U.S. that you're, you will or will not – uh, or is there a part that you're, you're – I mean, can somebody from all over the U.S. Uh, approach your program? We we represent to be a nationwide lender, but I would say we focus primarily on, on major cities in the surrounding areas. When areas become too rural uh, or the demographics are, you know, uh, um, 
are, are much smaller than the larger communities, that's, that's where we start to struggle because we start to have concerns about exit strategy or what if the property gets taken back, what will we do with it? So generally, we, we like to stay within the major cities and the surrounding towns. And are you operating overseas as well in, in uh, the UK where you're from or no? Yes, still, still, you know, relatively active in London. Yeah, you know, I did take a break from the London market for quite a few years, but the market has gone quite interesting over the last two years, and we're actively now involved in a number of projects in the London. So, do you have any kind of a crystal ball thought of uh, kind of a sense of things, given the uh, the election and just the the, the um, you know interest rates and the economy is improving? Is there any kind of a a forecast from Adam? <laughs> Good question. My forecast is I think prices have reached an all-time high, and you know where does the market sustain itself? Uh, you know, when you look at the average income that people need to have in order to buy a home in their community, prices have reached such a high point that the average family are now struggling to buy a home. Uh, I would say when you take that into consideration, at some point there's got to be a softening in the market and there's got to be a kind of reduction in prices. Um, the general consensus that we, we're seeing is that there's an oversupply of product and that, you know, sales have slowed down. So I'd say at some point in the next 12 to 24 months, there's got to be a decrease. I would say it's imminent. Well, and, and that seems to, to make sense. I, you know, no, as we've learned, nothing goes up forever. Uh, there's, yeah, there's been some, it's called a wave. I mean, you know, do you have a, you know, it rides high and then it rides low. Uh, it's been riding high now for about seven or eight years on a steady incline. It can only sustain itself for so long. When uh, people don't have enough income to buy, uh, then you know, the, you know, then all of a sudden, you know, prices start to slip, and you take, you know, say two or three houses that may be in the same street, and they're both asking three hundred thousand, and the one who needs to sell the most says, "Hey, I'll take two seventy-five. Well, that's the beginning of a slippery slope. And you know, for example, you take Miami, which is a city I know well and, uh, and love dearly. There is, you know, in Brickell, they've overbuilt it so much, you've got entire buildings sitting empty, and uh, they can't sell them. And even the rental market has slowed down because people aren't moving every, you know, every. Every year, people are staying in one place. It's you know the cost of moving is expensive, and uh, we're already seeing kind of a lot of kind of you know, what should have been successful projects like now getting into uh, hot water. Yeah, no, it's I, I've been reading uh, numerous uh, articles suggesting kind of rents, the uh, rate of increase has slowed down, and and even the vacancies are starting to pick up. So I think that's the. Uh, the party is not over, but it's uh, certainly it's late, and uh, maybe last call has been uh, called yet. Um, let me ask you this. So if, if an investor is um, uh, looking to purchase a property and they need money, what's the one thing that you can recommend they do uh, to be successful? Do a good analysis. You know, I have so many clients. They say, hey, um, we're buying this property. We're paying the full asking price. We're going to fix the property up, you know, and we're going to sell it, and we're making 10% profit. Wow. You know, they're so excited. And they haven't taken into consideration soft costs, closing costs, real estate taxes, debt service, carrying the property longer than expected, things costing more and taking longer. They don't think these things through. Um, and I see this a lot. And we get a lot of loans in that we turn away simply because they're coming to the table. They, they want to do a, um, a million-dollar fix and flip. They've got $50,000 to put down. And they just don't really kind of map out the transaction. And I think that... If I was to give advice to an investor that's kind of relatively new in the business, because I think inexperienced investors would know this already, I would hope, uh, is map out a transaction. Because if you don't have, by the time all said and done, a, you know, a healthy 25% markup in a worst-case scenario, then the deal doesn't work. You know, it's, I see a lot of um, clients come to me and their, their overall kind of like net profit after all said and done is about 10 or 15%. And the truth of the matter is that's not a good deal. And, you know, anyone can buy a property at full market or overpay or pay the, you know, the highest price. And anyone can fix that property up spending the amount of money on it. But people kind of, uh, they rely on too much. I think aggressive brokers telling them, yeah, I'll get you a million dollars for your house because they want the listing and they know that listing brings in clients. But the truth of the matter is that they need to do their homework and really understand that, you know, 
what the real market value is, what the real costs are, uh, uh, such a small margin with such a small deposit is more likely to end in failure than success. So the best advice I would give is, you know, have working capital to buy right and do your homework to the point where you have a healthy margin because those are the deals that will be successful. Well, and, and do you give any uh, credence to uh, Plan B? I, I think that's one of the things I recognize. I've seen people get into. They've got it all mapped out, like you said. And if the market turns or something, they're holding the property and they don't have the, uh, you know, they don't have the the mindset or the plan to, you know, how are they going to keep from losing the property? How are they going to service the debt, et cetera? Is any any thought on that? I mean, yeah, people just don't take into consideration, like, you know, running costs. I mean, I've done a lot of development work over the years. I've had some successes, and I've had some failures, too, you know. And, like, you, if you don't map it out, if you don't have liquid reserves to kind of cover everything, you, there's, there is no bailout. You, you know, once you go into foreclosure, it's a distressed asset. You know, people take out hard money loans to do an investment deal. And then they look for a hard money loan to pay off their hard money loan when they're in foreclosure. And, you know... Two years ago, that was something that you know was a lot more common, and you know, lenders were doing those types of deals. Nowadays, in this market, those types of deals, people look at it and they say, "Hey, you know, something, you're already in trouble. Why do we need the aggravation and the headache?" And they end up losing those properties. You know, the, you know in general, I'm seeing a lot of hard money you know, investment groups, including our own, that have just taken a little bit more of a uh, conservative approach when making these decisions. So definitely making sure that they have, like I said, liquid reserves and kind of really think the project through from start to finish. Just People just don't allow for worst-case scenarios, delays, and you know, over costs. And just about every project you ever see will take you know two to three months longer um, on the construction side and will cost in 10 to 15 to 20% more in total cost. And then, you know, if you allow for, uh, you know, like I say, a decrease in the market, then you want to be able to sell that property and still make money. So I think people, you know, they get very excited about, oh, look, if I buy this house and I, for 500000 I put 100 into it, I can sell it for a million. When if they weigh up all of those costs, in fact, we saw one recently, kind of the same scenario, that by the time I did the math, there was like less than a 5% profit margin. And I said, one thing goes wrong, you're upside down. It's like, this is not a good deal. And, you know, the uh, client was just arguing with me. And I'm like, listen, if you think it's a good deal, <laughs> take it somewhere else. <laughs> you know, so yeah, it's just like, it's a, you know, success is based on careful planning. You mentioned reserves. Is there any kind of a rule of thumb for, uh, you know, an amount or a percentage in reserves? If you do a fix and flip right, you should be able to be in and out of it in six months. You know, the whole purpose of fix and flipping is not to sit on the property for a year to, you know, to 18 months. You want to be out of it six, seven, eight months maximum. So I would say take into consideration you want to get the property at a good price. If everyone is bidding on it, it's probably not the, you know, the best property for an investment, you know. In some cases, that's not correct. In some cases, like, you know, a good, a good street, you know, where there's, a, you know, next to a good school, where there's very strong demand from local families to buy a finished house. Well, yeah, those will sell. There's not an exact role for every scenario. But I would say that, you know, um, when I first started buying real estate, for example, when I was uh, in my 20s and I was driving from London down to the coastal towns, Dover, Folkestone, Margate, uh, uh, areas like that, Hastings, I would go to every realtor in the high street and I'd give them my card and I'd say, you know, show me what you've got. I'd go and see 30, 40 listings over a three or four day period. And I'd basically offer 50% of market value on every property. And the realtors used to look at me like I was mad. But you'd be surprised at how many I ended up buying, you know, either at that 50% or between 50 to 60% because people needed to sell. I ended up with a good deal. I would then fix those properties up. I would rent them out. And then some I would keep, and some I, you know, and if I kept them, I would refinance them, uh, and that was my long-term play. And if I was looking to be in and out of it, I would get it up to sell, ten percent below the market, knowing that I already bought it right, and I'd be in and out of it very quickly. And I started growing up a healthy client base in terms of having like my exit strategy for properties that we were selling. And you know, uh, you know, all the local realtors were calling me every time they got new listings if the client needed to sell quickly, knowing that I had the cash and that I would move fast. So buying at the right price is everything. Good advice. Very good advice. Um, Adam, I'm looking down kind of my list of things I was wanting to talk to you about today. I, I want to make sure we're uh, uh, giving you a, a 
you know, letting the, the listeners know all about what you're doing here with uh, Westland International. Is there anything I didn't ask you that uh, uh, you'd like to talk about? Uh, we can talk about some new projects that we're working on. Yeah, let's do. Yeah. So uh, as we were speaking before, uh, you, before you hit the button, the magic button, I was telling you about a new project that I'm working on called Inspired Business Journal, a magazine launch that we're going to be doing um, probably in March or April of this coming year. Yeah, well, can you share any more what that's going to be about? Okay, well, the magazine is meant to inspire, uh, hence the name. Uh, we're targeting professionals who are looking to grow their careers or to uh, give them you know, some wind in their cells to take a step up. And we're also approaching, you know, targeting um, the MBA crowd or anybody who would want to kind of quit their job and start their own business and to kind of get insight from people who have succeeded in different industries, how they did it, how they got their start, how they grew their business, what went wrong, how did they fix it, and things like that, to kind of give some motivation and inspiration to people to say, you can do this. It's not impossible. It doesn't take everything to start a business. It takes uh, a bit of passion. It takes a bit of vision. It takes some hard work and to kind of encourage people to get out there and try something else or try something new or to you know, increase their goals. Um, we will be doing features on professionals and entrepreneurs uh, and interviews with them, which will be available on YouTube and various other outlets. And it's an interesting project that's coming together. That sounds interesting. And you say uh, March-ish, is that kind of your target? March or April. We believe that the magazine side of it will be ready for March, but the production side for the YouTube channel may not be ready till April. Well, I don't, I don't, I'm, uh, I'm sure that'll be very, very entertaining and, and uh, educational and, and uh, interesting, and, and I'm sure the listeners will uh, look forward to checking that out. Um, is there anything the else interesting you guys- side, The interesting side of it is it's uh, a business that we're starting, uh, considering it's a magazine launch, and it's going to be in print online, plus a YouTube channel that we're hoping to air on some junior networks. Um, I'm not going to name any names yet on that, but it's actually, you know, with some like, you know, uh, late-night cable slots. Uh, it's a project that we're starting for under $100,000, and I believe it will be in profit by the end of its first year. So... You know, most people think about the amount of money it would cost to launch a magazine and uh, you know, to film 365 days of the year um, and to have you know, a news outlet, a feature outlet, and an interview outlet. It's, you, know, you can start a successful business with a small amount of investment if you plan it right, which is no, I, part of the inspiration of the magazine. That's, that's great. And, uh, no, it is. It's fascinating just what you can do now with uh, technology that's available and, and uh, you know, well-planned, well-coordinated, uh, professionally done. Uh, it, it's great. I'm, I'm excited to see what you do. You said the magazine's going to be in print. Is that going to be a... Uh, a monthly, a quarterly? How often are you going to print? It's going to be monthly. We're going to do a limited print release when we launch the magazine. As, as selling the actual hard copy is not, you know, one of the biggest goals of the of the uh, magazine. But we will do once we've been up and running for a few months uh, a subscription where people can subscribe to the magazine and receive a hard copy in the mail. Got it. Well, that that uh, that ought to be uh, amazing. Uh, I'm sure that's going to be an exciting journey for you and and uh, all that are involved with that. So that's great. Yeah, and we'll probably have various kind of retail outlets around the country, which will be like authorized kind of distributors where they'll have it in, in their stores. But, uh, but again, the, the hard copy is really kind of um, – it's more presentational. The, you know, the website itself is where we're hoping people will go and see us. It's free, so they don't have to worry about paying for us or subscribing to see it online. And you know, I think it, we're hoping that it will provide inspiration to many people to help them uh, take a step up in their existing industry or p- those looking to start their business and to kind of get some ideas and some inspiration of, you know, it's uh, the, the biggest barrier that people focus when they're trying to do anything in business is fear and overcoming those fears and overcoming those hurdles or the kind of denial that it takes a certain amount of money or energy or kind of position in order to you know, move forward. And, you know, the whole goal of this magazine is to prove people that is not the case. If you have the desire to succeed, you can and will succeed. And, you know, Inspired Business Journal will provide that motivation to people. Well, you mentioned the, the fear there. What's the last time you were afraid? 
<laughs> every day. <Yeah. laughs> you know, um, business is not something you enter into lightly. You know, I'm a pretty ambitious person, and I have huge goals to accomplish myself. You know. Um, this magazine that we're launching is going to be the first of uh, you know, a couple of other publications we're looking to do. We're looking to uh, create, uh, I'm looking to create a business school, a real estate school in business and finance and real estate, so a national program, public speaking as well. Um, you know, when you uh, run your own business, you, you know, it's a passion. It's a way of life. It's not just a job or something. And, you know, it's like I always want to know that my team, you know, are comfortable and doing well. I want to know that, you know, uh, I want to learn and grow as much as I can. I don't like to make mistakes anyone, as anyone else does. And I think if you don't have fear, then you're reckless because you're not, you know, you're not throwing caution to the wind. I mean, fear isn't important to keep you grounded, but it's just a question of not allowing that fear to stop you from moving forward. Well, when you say you're, every day you're, you're, you have fear, is it motivating? Is that, do you, do you, is it limiting? Is it, uh, is it something that you you look at and go, how am I going to overcome that? It's, I call it grounding because, you know, my fear has never stopped me from moving forward on anything that I wanted to do. But what it does do is it has to tell you that for as much as you can succeed in life, there's always the possibility of failure. And if you don't think about what can go wrong in any scenario, then you probably will fail. So fear for me is not something that I say, oh my God, I can't do this because of fear. It's just, I would say for me, it's something that it grounds you to the point where you think about things carefully and say, how do I do this right? How do I do this right? And think, I'm not so arrogant that everything I do will turn to gold and, and that, you know, you sit there, you make a list of things that you want to do, how you want to do it, how it can go right, how it can go wrong, how you manage those expectations, you know, keeping it real with this air of optimism, but at the same time allowing for a worst case scenario. And I say, so for me, fear is something that, um, you channel to, so that you do things the right way. It's not something for me that's ever held me back. But for many people, you know, I think it does hold people back. So many people I know, for example, mm-hmm. when I left England to go to America, they said, oh, you'll never get a visa. You'll never get a green card. They'll never make you a citizen. And yet I got my visa, or I got my green card, and I am now a citizen. Um, so many people said when I opened my office in the Empire State Building, oh, you'll never survive five minutes. And I was there for five years. You know, so many people said, you know, when when the recession came in and, you know, we took giant losses, oh, you'll never recover from that. You'll never um, be able to, you know, do that again. And yet just about everyone I know in the industry that did fall, none of them got back up again. And yet here I am, I got back up and I just didn't do it, you know, uh, like casually. I did it with, with a smile on my face, ringing that bell saying, I'm coming. And I've grown West One International over six and a half years. So I would say, you know, for many people, fear definitely holds them back from doing something. For me, it it just makes me think carefully about each step I take. Well, I like that. uh, You know, think carefully. I think um, too many people, and I've I've been there myself. Is you think and 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 you think. And uh, end up doing nothing because the, the fear holds you back. And and I think one of the things that I've kind of recognized, and I'll, I'll be curious to, to uh, get your your take on this. But when you're when you're doing all that analysis, is it important to get to a conclusion quickly to where yes. you can? All right. All right. And, and some, you know, when, you know, you, you definitely got to think things through. And I would say never rush, you know, your thinking process. But the more you think about something, the more you talk yourself out of it, or the more someone else talks you talks you out of it. I, I always say that if you have an idea and everybody hates it, it's probably a pretty good idea. If you, um, you know, sometimes you know all the math tells you that you're wrong and it won't succeed. And sometimes you say, hey, you know something, screw the math. Can I say that? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, uh, let's hope everyone's over 18. Um, yes. And do it anyway. Sometimes you just have to you know, go with your gut. I have to tell you, I've done several projects in my life where I just went with my gut and I ignored all the obvious signs and they were so successful. But that's also gone the other way as well. So you can't say, hey, everything I do is right. I don't need to think about it. So, um, but planning is important. But I say I make most decisions pretty quickly. Uh, when I decided to do Inspire, the idea came to me. 
uh, as the idea came to me, I mapped it out in my head, probably over a two-day window. I mean, it wasn't a great length of time. And um, and as I started mapping out, and I came out and said, you know, I need to give this a name. And I was thinking about it, and I was talking to one of my team members, and the word inspire came out. And I said, you know, I like that. That's a great idea. You know, let's inspire people. Let's motivate people. Let's push people. But the whole idea of it for Inspire Business Journal was probably evolved over about a four- or five-day window from start to finish of the concept. And then it was the website. I have a full-time web guy that works for me. Uh, he's great. And he did the West One website. He's done the Adam Cohen Today website. And, you know, he's now doing Inspire, which you've had a sneak peek at. And um, it's evolving. And as it's evolving, you know, we're starting to map out the requirements of the business. But the whole thing, from where you see it today, it was launched from beginning to where it is now very quickly. And, you know, in terms of time and cost, it was a gut feeling as opposed to a mathematical feeling. But, I, you know, I gave it my thought. I, where can I go wrong? Where can I go right? It kind of links into other things that we're trying to do. And I said, let's just get on with it and go move forward. And as you can see, the, you, uh, the results are already significantly along. How many people are on your team that you uh, work with when you're, you're in the idea mode? I have, I would say, about eight or nine full-time members of my team that work with me on a day-to-day basis. But as far as my confidant team, I would say two or three. Do you have uh, contrarians on there that will question you, or or what? what what's of course. The, well, of course. Take, well, take uh, us through. I'm not I, mean, I mean, is it? Do they? They. Uh, what, what What are their strengths? I guess is it? Is it all everybody kind of big picture thinkers like yourself, or is there actually uh, no? Actually, no. I mean, for, um, I guess one of my most senior associates, you know, he's a, a, an attorney by trade, and he's just the opposite. He's like, Adam, we should focus on doing this right now and doing this and tries to keep me grounded, which is probably a, a, good, you know, a good move. But at the same time, I take the view that, you know, I don't want to run before I walk, but I think you need to cruise along at a healthy speed. And if it adds value to everything else that you're doing, then it's a good idea. And, um, and I've always been a very big thinker with very big ambition. And to me, you know, my, my team, they do try to kind of um, say, let's move forward cautiously. And, you know, I listen to them to some extent. But at the same time, you know, uh, I'm very aggressive, and you know, if I like an idea, I'll roll with it. At what point, as your ideas kind of mature, uh, do you have to let go of of uh, the controls a little bit, given the fact that you continue to kind of grow your operation? Yeah, that's an interesting question because I am a bit of a control freak by nature. Um, I would say West One International, I've been running that literally with, you know, I, I'm going to say 98% authority since I started the company. I would say as of 2017, I am delegating about 75% of that authority to two individuals in my team, believing that they are now, you know, the company is where I want it to be and that they are strong enough to handle that authority. And, you know, my role in the company will be a lot less as I move forward with a lot of these other projects and different things that we're trying to do in the coming year. Uh, so a lot of, for example, West One responsibility is going to be delegated to those two team members, uh, and they're excited for that challenge. But I'll still be kind of keeping a close watch. But uh, I I take, the, I take the view I like to try and hold on to control as much as I can to make sure it's going in the right direction. But when the time is right and I feel good about where a project is and I feel good about the people who are on the team for that project is when I'll start to say, okay, this is, you know, I pointed you in the direction, let's keep it going in that direction. And if it starts to steer away, I will jump back on and say, nope, we need to stay back on that course. Um, so it's kind, of a, it's kind of the time, it takes a while. And let me ask you this: So, the as you let go, you mentioned you've got your your uh, two people that are going to be taking over the majority of the responsibility uh, that you've been uh, taking on. How much of that is systems, or is it just a, a, an understanding that how the business operates and, and the the human capital? I would say it's based on the understanding of the business and what we do and what we what we can and cannot do in terms of you know providing service or funding a transaction. So um, 
based on their experience in working with me for quite a you know, lengthy period of time, there's no question of what we can or cannot do. And if it's a question of a cannot, cannot do, anything that we, you know, before we would turn it away is something that's still discussed, you know, uh, with my involvement to turn around and say uh, that we are going to turn something away or we are going to approve something, I'll still have that final say on both scenarios. But for these, say, circumstances, that to get it to that point where we're saying yes or no, they will handle the majority of that. Well, it sounds it's like... Never, it's uh, never a complete relinquishment of power. Just because it's my name above the door, I have to make sure in all cases that, you know, important, you know, that I'm involved in important decision-making. Certainly, the, uh, you know, I think that's the risk any entrepreneur runs as you grow is uh there's you know there's a capacity issue uh if you are a one-man band you've got uh there's only so many so much time and and so much uh, ability uh as a one-person operation but as you grow you've got to be able to delegate that and, uh, I would say if, if I had to give advice to any business owner there should never be any part of your business that you cannot jump in on. For example, this week I had several members of my team who were out sick, you know, with the flu and everything else and, you know, I had to kind of jump in and do a lot of their work and thankfully we're very well organized. We keep great notes on every file that we're working on. We have over 100 files in our active pipeline this week alone um, and you know, because of my experience in the business, I'm able to, if, if you know, we're a man down or two men down or three as we were this week, uh, to kind of like step in and fulfill those roles and know exactly where we are. You know, I can look at a file within 15 or 20 minutes, tell you like with high degree of accuracy whether or not we're going to do that deal or not or what the problems are um, or what solutions we can come up with. So, you know, my team members that I'm giving, you know, a lot more authority to, they are qualified enough to make a lot of those kind of decision-making as well. But, you know, a successful business person never leaves his business to the will of others. If you're not on top of as many things as possible, it will fail. So as much as I relinquish, you know, a lot of kind of the day-to-day, um, like final decision-making is always going to stay with the kind of um, with the, the right person. Well, it's, uh, I find it interesting that, uh, or actually, I'm, I'm impressed that you're, uh, you're still able to jump in and and uh, you do all that as as you grow. It's that's impressive. Pretty good at it too. It's kind of <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, I find that a little uh, irritating sometimes, but <laughs> well, but but uh, you know, I think that's that's a uh, wrestling match for anybody who's trying to grow a business. Is you know the. Um, the risk of of not letting the, the the people you hire to do the job, to where they 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 feel like you know you're going to always jump in, uh, whereas you let them do it. But if they're not there, you can jump in and do it. Uh, that's I mean that seems like a pretty pretty uh, ideal situation, and that that the systems and the and the content is that consistent where, you know, whether it be you or, or your people can do the same job without a uh, hiccup, that's, that's great. Yeah, I mean, like I said, it's important that, you know, if, for a business to function, if you're a man down and there's no one else that can do that job or so someone leaves and then you don't know what to do or how to do it, you know, that can cause a major issue, especially when you're working in finance where you've got strict deadlines that you have to work within. So it's important that, you know, especially in my business, that, you know, if I have to, that I can step in and kind of pick up where that person left off. And, you know, the biggest handicap there is quality of information. And we've had issues in the past where people have left and we didn't know where um, certain information was pertaining to a particular file. And, you know, and you learn from that to the point now where we know where every file is, every you know, everything's updated multiple times a day. So if I have to step in and kind of know what's going on with a file and where that information is, it's all you know, it's all available. Uh, technology is great. I can get it on my iPad. I can get it on my laptop at home, computer in the office, even on my phone if I'm out. So information is, and you know, information management is a crucial issue there. Well, and as you were kind of describing your scenario there, I was just thinking about how often it is, especially around the holiday, where you get the first email saying that, you know, Larry's going to be out of the office. His backup is Kim, and then you 
press through and you get to Kim and Kim says her backup is Larry because she's out of the office and neither one of them would talk to each other and you've got this, you know, the, there's nobody there, you know. And uh, I just, it's a, and, annoying to me that in this day and age with all the technology we have available, uh, you know, getting in touch with the person you're trying to deal with is more difficult than ever. And, and, you know, we we have those issues as well, but when that's the case as the owner of the business, if I have to roll up my sleeves and start doing the work, then I get on and do it, and I've done it many times. And uh, I think that's what's important about uh, a lot of people start a business and they say, well, hey, I'm the chief. Let the uh, people, you know, the employees go and do their work because that's what I pay them for. And they take a step back, and they don't realize is that when, you know, things are going wrong, it's because the business owner was absent. He was busy on the golf course, not caring about, you know, the service that he was providing. And I would say, you know, uh, that's never been my approach. My, my approach has always been business first. So if something needs to be attended to, then that's the first thing that I deal with. I like it. Adam, I, uh, I want to say thank you for uh, taking the time to do this again. Oh, and, my pleasure. Uh, Thank you for having me again. I uh, look forward to our next opportunity. Before you go, or before I let you go, uh, what's the best way for listeners to uh, get in touch with you? Best way really is, you know, via our website. Um, you know, if they have any inquiries about real estate finance, they can go to uh, www.westwaninternational.com and they can contact us through the site, phone numbers, email addresses, and, you know, contact information is all there. If they wanted to get in touch with me about anything else, they can go to my personal website, which is uh, adamcohentoday.com. Uh, and again, they, you know, my only contact information is all available there. And I'll uh, put those uh, in the show notes in case you're uh, driving and uh, not able to uh, to type there. So, all right. Yeah, I uh, provide you links to all of those. I think. Yeah, yeah, we've got it. So, Adam, I want to say thank you again. I always enjoy our our uh, conversations, and I look forward to our next one. Likewise, so, uh, I look forward to talking to you in the new year when we get uh, when we do the official launch of Inspire. You got it. That's all we've got for you this week. We hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to check out westwaninternational.com for funds when you need to get a deal done. We know you're busy. We thank you for making time for us today. We do appreciate you. Until next time, thanks for listening to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CREPN Radio. You're listening to CREPN Radio for influential commercial real estate professionals. For more information on this or any of our guests, like us on Facebook, CREPN Radio.